contrarian, leave it to contrarian badass, badass Reggie Middleton. He called the housing crash. He called the collapse of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and the crisis in the Eurozone banking system. Hello, everyone. This is David Morgan of TheMorganReport.com. And today I have got Reggie Middleton. And I'm going to give you my thoughts on him. And Reggie, of course, you can add to your bio. We're going to put it in the show notes if we're able to do so. But uh, Reggie Middleton talked about on RT, uh, Russia Today, as the contrarian badass. Reggie Middleton uh, was the first at the CNBC stock picking contest to win the contest. He won it the first year, and I believe he won it the second year also. On yeah. top of that, you are a big picture thinker, and you uh, really have the markets uh, well I- idealized. In other words, you really can see the future more or less, meaning that you uh, saw the bear, the Bear Stearns and the Lehman Brothers crisis before it happened, talked about what's going on in Europe well ahead of time, been with Max Kaiser many times. And let me just say, I wish I would have uh, gotten a better relationship earlier on, but there's nothing like the present. So I uh, wanted to get you on this uh, series that we're doing on cryptos because a lot has happened in your world and we're going to get into that. I will just say one last thing and that you often refer to yourself as the disruptor in chief. So if you want to say anything else about your background, Reggie, go ahead and I've got a fair amount of questions for you. Okay. Um, just want to make one slight correction. Um, I don't predict the future. I naively uh, or I innocently look at the present and I pay attention to the past. You know, a lot of people tend to forget history and you know the saying, it doesn't repeat, but it definitely rhymes. So um, if you remove, if you're objective and take your expectations and emotions out of the equation, you could be fairly wrong and do rather well. Um, but most people, very, very smart people don't do that. So it's not intellect that allows people to give the pers- the patina of being able to predict the future. It's uh, objectivity. You know, I know what I don't know, which means I know a lot more than many. Very good. Yeah. That's uh, well said. A uh, man who knows limits knows a great deal. So in 2013, you were the founder of Decentralized Finance, and you have several patents. Some have been issued and some are pending. What I like to do right now is to start with the macro fundamentals and the true value of cryptos. Okay. Um, that's like an open question to me that this is still out. We've only got an hour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so to begin with, the crypto industry is not what the, the vast majority of the media that makes it out to be. It's not about currencies and it's not about investments. The crypto industry is software. Okay, plain and simple. It's just that it's bytes, spits, and zeros software mixed with hardware and networks to create a system. Or as Vitalik Buterin likes to say, um, the way he markets Ethereum, a world computer. Okay, now this world computer or world computers, because now there are many versions of it, um, it's designed to do things. Um, on the public side, the public networks, they're designed to do things without uh, the need or trust of an authoritative third party, a fancy way of saying somebody in control. Now, that mantra is often more make believe than fact, but there is some fact to it depending on which network you're using. Depending on what those networks were designed for and what applications are made of those networks, then you take the next step and then you could discuss things such as cryptocurrencies or digital currencies or digital stocks or investments or identity or transportation systems or communication systems, et cetera. That's what makes it so promising. In the beginning, um, I'm a technophile. I'm a certified nerd. Um, I like technology. I love to solve problems. And I like pursuing truths, truths as in provable facts, not um, entrenched opinion. And that is my natural calling. And that allowed me to look at early crypto. And I was early, early as 2008, 2009. I got in in 2013. So I was like four years after the start. But when I did get in, I was able to see things that um, I believe most of the community couldn't or didn't because they looked at it from either a programming perspective, a developer perspective, um, or 
uh, speculator perspective, looking at the little accounts of value, like Bitcoin prices going up and down. The minute I read the Bitcoin wiki and smart contracts and the programmable portion of it, I was like, wow. And then I read the white paper and I'm like, I really believe in this. It was a phenomenal idea. For those who don't know, the Bitcoin white paper is not a scam. It's not, you know, pie in the sky. It basically solved what you call, what is called the Byzantine generals problem. It allowed you to send something digital and ephemeral through the internet without it being copied and spent twice. So you could do business with me on the other side of the country by sending me compensation digitally, digital money, and I couldn't just make a copy of it by clicking copy and paste. And so you can actually buy something with that digital money and that digital money is spent. And the entire country, the entire world agrees that it's spent when it's spent. Before Bitcoin, as far as I know, that was never able to be done. Uh, so that opened up an entire world of potential commerce. Because earlier, we go all the way back to the caveman slash cave woman days, and you had to lug large amounts of commodities or assets to do business. You know, oxen, hunter-gatherers, you know, fruit, vegetables, grains, etc. Then we had currency, which is basically an agreed upon proxy for these commodities. So instead of carrying an oxen on your back, or you can actually take uh, cowrie shells, little pieces of metal, um, whether it be nickel, iron, silver, gold, leather from Central Asia, et cetera. And then as economies became more advanced, allegedly, or just more complicated, uh, people started manipulating these proxies for value. One of the major manipulations is debasement. So when you had a current your economy is not doing well, instead of striving to boost your economy and economic output, you can actually devalue the little proxies, which makes everything look like the economy is doing better. But we all know that's a similar outcome. It looks like it, but it wasn't happening. Now, with Bitcoin and Bitcoin's progeny, you can actually send these proxies around the world without the friction of having to carry it in a bag, without the friction of it being counterfeited, without many frictions, and they can't be double spent. So. Uh, most who derive Bitcoin have not read the white paper and don't understand what was in it. Now, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. Bitcoin has its issues, um, and its primary issue is it is off its way. The Satoshi white paper was a stroke of genius, absolute genius. Easily would have got the Nobel Peace Prize in economics, finance, or technology, whichever. But he didn't apply for it, you know, et cetera. It, it is what it is. As the Wall Street style interest got a hold of it. They went, they moved it from its core functionality of creating a much more frictionless commerce environment to what Wall Streeters want to do, speculation of price movement. And that's where we are mostly are now. Mostly, but not 100 percent Okay. When I got into this in 2013, I saw what I think Satoshi originally envisioned. Pure functionality that wasn't available just a couple of years before or throughout the history of mankind. And that's where I built my products and that's where I, I, how I wrote the patent applications. And those are the applications that have been granted as actual patents. So they seem far ranging, but I think I was just in sync with what Satoshi um, envisioned. And for those who don't know, Satoshi Nakamoto is a name, most likely an anagram or something for the inventor of Bitcoin. That's probably one of the best explanations of cryptos I've ever heard. And I mean that uh, just because I love to talk. I think we are in alignment in some ways here because my mission statement is to teach and empower people's people to understand the benefits of an honest financial system. And when you get down to it, the blockchain basically is immutable. That ledger is in, is perfect or more or less as close as the human experience. So it puts trust back in the system. If I make a deal with you and it's on the blockchain, we have agreed upon terms, then you get paid in digital money and we're both satisfied. So I just wanted to make that clear. One thing I'm a little bit unclear of, and I know this is a long conversation, but Vertasium, and I want you to explain that, but we want to know from the start, is Vertasium required to fit on top of the Bitcoin protocol or could it fit somewhere else or could it operate on its own? 
Well, Verite is the, the token. I'll just as the definition is simply prepared, prepaid um, access fees. So what you're doing is when you buy Microsoft Office, um, you purchase it from Microsoft for let's say two hundred dollars. Okay, or let's make it easy, three hundred and sixty dollars. You buy one of your licenses. That's amortizes to about one dollar a day for the rest of the year. Okay, as you use it, right, you pay off the license that you prepay up front. Well, veritation tokens were originally envisioned to be just that, prepaid fees to access our software, our consulting, our intellectual capital, and eventually our patents. And so you would spend your veritation to access the software, to buy consulting or research services from our staff, or to license our patents. At the time, the patents weren't granted, at least two have granted now. Um, we built software very quickly after we launched Veritation Tokens, and research and the consulting was available immediately from the day of launch. Now, um, we got into, we and I personally got into uh, litigation, or to be more accurate, the SEC got <laughs> brought litigation to us and destroyed the business model. Um, but there are still roughly 2% of the Veritation Tokens left. Unfortunately, their contract has been broken, but um, I am strongly entertaining still potentially, potentially um, allowing them to be spent for certain services. Not because, I'm going to be clear, of any contractual um, warranty or guarantee or right, but if I do it, I'll be doing it, you know, simply because I think that might be the right thing to do, but I don't want it to be seen out there as some type of legal obligation. Um, and that's a description of what the Veritasium tokens were. Veritasium, the company, created software, and you know we have a variety of products. Unfortunately, practically all the products except for one were closed down. Um, but the one that wasn't closed down is uh, tokenized metals, um, tokenized gold, silver, and palladium, in various denominations and weights. Okay, well, let's explore that then. Uh... You have the patent on tokenization of precious metals. I'm involved with a project called uh, LOAD. If you're interested, it's ag.load.one. And we're tokenizing metals along with uh, many others. They're, we're not the only ones. So let's go further into that. Reggie, tell me more. Well, it's constructed where you have the token. We create an arbitrary token, um, just a piece of uh, information on a blockchain. That information is encoded with uh the type of metal that it represents let's say one kilogram of gold um it comes prepaid with storage and insurance and is able to be it's um held in bearer form so you buy it from us you go through kyc program okay uh the kyc program is custom built on the blockchain so it's purely blockchain based except for certain storage of information okay and it's encrypted so you go through KYC, you pass KYC, you purchase the precious metals using um, wire, uh, USDT, or Ethereum, okay, or ACH. Once it's purchased, you get the tokens in your personal wallet, which means they're in your possession. Totally, we have no control over it. You can do whatever you want with it, obviously. It's yours. You can buy it. You can sell it to somebody else. You can give it to somebody else. You could trade it. Or... You can send it back to the company. When, the op when the, um, that particular function was fully operational, you were able to sell it back to us optionally. We didn't have to, but we'd also make an offer to sell it, to buy it back from you by at a discount to par. Or you can redeem it. To redeem it, you send it back. You press you know, the interface that says redeem. You put in an address, and you have to be the person that was kyc of course. You put in that address, you pay for shipping fees, and we overnight it back out to you. As long as you aren't in any of the um, restricted countries, you know, from FinCEN, et cetera. Well, that's great. That's one of the few that actually redeems. We do at uh, Load, one I'm associated with. A lot of others are actually derivatives products because you're required to settle in, you know, in the cash settlement. In other words, in a currency of your choice, but you can't get the metal itself. So thanks for right. making that clear. I want to circle back a little bit. I'm not sure I heard your answer. Maybe you did. Is Vertasium or your platform required to sit on top of Bitcoin, or could it operate, or could it operate independently? It, it it needs a blockchain. Okay, it does have its own blockchain, 
but the blockchain that it uses is irrelevant okay. as long as as long as it has um well even so it doesn't even need to have its own programming platform like ethereum has small contracts using what they call full touring programming language which means you can write more advanced applications where bitcoin has a less complex but increasingly more complex programming language okay but we started off on a bitcoin blockchain right um we are blockchain agnostic, which means I really don't care. I'm not in the blockchain business. As long as it works, we'll use it. Um, what we really are are intellectual capital, basically, expressed as software, um, like creating a precious metals token that's redeemable. From the company's perspective, we could care less with the redeem. Instead of anything, we'd be less likely to buy the assets back because we have to be liquid for the uh, currency to buy it back. So that's why the buyback is optional for us or was. And this we, we're winding this program down. Just, you know, I don't want to make it appear that we're still going full bore on this because we're winding it down. But at the time that was going full blast, we were optionally buy it back or ship it to you. And if you ship it, you get it the actual metal ship. So it doesn't matter whether there's no discount or premium to park. Okay, but you have to pay shipping fees. Um, sure. That's not that consequential if you're in the continental U.S., but if you're in Dubai, then it'll add up. Yes, sir. So where's the industry headed? Where do you see, I mean, you're, and thanks for the correction on the opening, but uh, no crystal ball involved. Objectivity, where do you think the industry's heading? Okay. Well, you don't, you don't need a crystal ball for that one. Uh, <laughs> Wall Street is coming in and do its thing, and they are going to take over. Um, Wall Street banks, the money center banks, their entire business is basically being a gatekeeper. Um, I could break down the entire banking business very easily. Um, you could use us. Reggie in New York, David in West Upper Pacific West Coast, Washington. Okay. We're on the phone. You say, hey, I want to send you $100 and you can send me uh, $111, uh, 111 euro. We are on the phone right now using voice over IP. We can do that deal. We don't really need anybody except for the guy who gets right between us. And he blocks the camera so I can't see you and you can't see me. And he's going to charge us a fee to move the hand away from the camera. And that guy's called a bank. So he puts his hand in front of the camera or her hand. He charges a fee. You pay the fee. You remove it. He may, as a courtesy, actually bring the money from you to me um, or from me to you. But that is very, very easy. It takes very little talent, very little technical expertise, you know, and not even much infrastructure in the day and age, this day and age. So crypto in general allows us to circumvent and not need the guy who puts their hand in front of the camera. Because now their camera is everywhere. And we got this conversation everywhere. And we could send our currency directly. And it doesn't have to be currency, it could be anything. Once you have a currency, you have a data source you send that data source into the currency you could transform that currency into almost anything it just lives on a blockchain so it could be real estate bonds stocks commodities title to um, property business private business equity voting results you name it personal identity this is, can all be done without that guy who just puts his hand over the camera and charges us to remove it but when you take that guy out, you take a lot of money out of the system and a lot of profit and a lot of bonuses. So that guy has a stated interest and invested interest to make sure he can do this. So as the person that, or the entities that do that, they're a gatekeeper and they're the gatekeeper to capital. Gatekeepers of capital to capital, by definition, have prodigious amounts of capital. Okay, and capital is what makes this country run. Um, so they have significant influence over regulators, over politicians, over other businesses and the economy in general. That is being exercised, in my opinion. Um, the regulatory environment for entrepreneurial crypto companies is downright dangerous in the U.S. Um, actual regulations are not very clearly written. Actually, don't exist clearly, in my opinion, but it could be I'm just not small enough to understand it. That could actually be it. Um, but in the minor case, minor, in the minor chance that that's not the case, it's not very clear. Um, so I don't want to get myself in trouble and say the regulators are acting at the behest or captured by large companies, large banks. I don't want to say that. 
But I can say that it's much easier for large banks to come in and do something than a smaller entrepreneur. And as they move into this space, realize that this space is very threatening to them. The fintech space, the technology space, particularly social media companies and large um, network fintechs like Google, and the blockchain space. The blockchain space allows you to just remove banks out of the situation, which is pro possibly why, possibly, right? why the blockchain space has such issues uh, in terms of regulation and clarity. Now, let's suppose that's not the case. The banks do move in, and the banks are, in general, more experienced businessmen and women than the typical uh, tech startup, especially a blockchain space startup. Um, in the beginning, they didn't believe in patents. You know, the open source community said patents are bad. That's not how business is done in the U.S. Okay, patents aren't bad. Patents are good. Sometimes, most of the time, patents are necessary. They also said, you know, these things are good. These things are bad. Focus on this. Don't focus on that. Very fancy white papers, very little execution, um, et cetera, et cetera. They don't focus on business management. And I'm not knocking them. In general, these are observations. When the Wall Street banks come in, they do things the opposite, right? They spend a decent amount of money on patenting. The second most prodigious patent filer was Bank of America. OK, um, then you had J.P. Morgan, you have Citibank, you have a bunch of other banks. They are very, very staunch business management structure um, executors. And I think that the industry in general is still not prepared, despite the fact they've had 10 years of preparation. They're still not prepared to uh, more than 12 years of preparation. They're still not prepared to take on the more advanced management legal regimens of Wall Street. And even if they were prepared, there's still a capital issue. You know, they have the capital of venture capitalists, and potentially token offerings, which have basically been wiped out by the SEC, versus trillions, $8 trillion balance sheets on JP Morgan. So when they come in, I think they're going to come in and run roughshod. And that's what I see. Um, I see direct competition where they sit on their private networks, like Ethereum's private version, which JP Morgan runs on and JPM coin versus the public networks, which the leader is still Ethereum, and then you have the small entrepreneurs on top of it. So certain entities such as the Ethereum and the Ethereum Foundation, et cetera, are well-suited, you know, win or lose, but there are others who are not so well-suited. Um, they can have advantages, but their culture did not prepare them for running a business in the U.S., particularly against probably the strongest lobby and the most aggressive industry in the world. And that's including a lot of other industries. You're talking oil, big tobacco. <laughs> so, you know, automotive. So if you could beat those industries out, pharma, you're doing something. And I think the banking industry is that industry to beat them up. Now, that's a lot of truth that are going to burn some coattails and probably get a lot of pushback against me. So, <laughs> but that's how I see it. It's not truth, it's Reggie's opinion. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, I want to give you some feedback. Uh, we've been following the blockchain at the Morgan Report for about four years. And this year, or last year, I should say 2021, January, I said, look out, Wall Street's discovered Bitcoin. No telling how far it's going to go. And uh, these are my thoughts, but, you know, they are pretty good at getting thing, people excited. And, of course, later in the year, they came out with the uh, ETF. Um, and I... From what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're on the same page. I think most people are missing the protocol and are focusing on the little BTC and how many of those things I could collect and what the value is rather than what the you know what Bitcoin is really designed to do, which you have explained to us. It's my understanding, I'd like you to verify, that it's really not, Bitcoin is not really decentralized at this point in time. I interviewed a gentleman named Kurt Wukert that explained that basically MasterCard has taken over uh, Bitcoin. In other words, they've hijacked it. Not every single one. I know there are independent people that own it. I know there's people that own it in size, but for all practical purposes, the banks have come in. Am I, is Kurt correct in that? What's your thoughts about Wall Street's connection with Bitcoin presently? Well, I don't know if they've if MasterCard, one company is taking it over, but the entire ethos of Bitcoin has left the white paper, like I said earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, Bitcoin is not concerned with frictionless peer-to-peer -peer payments. You know, the biggest, the biggest news stories 
the most mind share, what most people talk about is the price of Bitcoin, not what it does, what you can do with it. Right. Now, you have the Lightning Network, which is, you know, not without its faults, but it's a totally different situation. The Lightning Network allows you to make payments for a less than a penny or a penny. So you could do micro payments. You could do it very quickly, seconds, a minute, seconds. You could do it for small amounts of money across the world. But Lightning Network is not, you know, on the tip of everybody's tongue. It is a threat, though. Um, I'm not super bullish on Bitcoin from a fundamental perspective, but from a macro perspective, it has promise. Combine the micro network with the fact of Bitcoin's proof of work, and it is difficult but not impossible to break it. Um, and those two facts combined with the reality that countries with weak currencies are at the behest of the IMF, the World Bank, the U.S., etc., um, whether maliciously or not, they still are. The use of Bitcoin allows them to escape that. El Salvador is a perfect example, and they adopt big, um, Bitcoin as legal tender. The IMF came and made a bunch of what I would consider threatening proclamations about it being risky. What El Salvador did is not risky at all. They didn't adopt it as a reserve currency. Okay, They adopted it as legal tender, meaning that if you paid your taxes or if you paid a vendor in Bitcoin, the vendor has to take it. The vendor doesn't have to accept Bitcoin volatility risk. It could be converted immediately. So that's like saying, um, we'll let you pay in blue dollars as well as green dollars. Okay, but you don't have to pay in blue dollars if you don't want to. And IMF is saying that's going to destroy your economy. It's going to drop your credit rating. Really? Now, notice there are no real reasons behind that. It's just a threat. And then they came up with a Bitcoin bond and they said, you know, this is risky and you're going, your credit rating is going to be destroyed, et cetera. Why? And now after they announced the Bitcoin bomb, Bitcoin dropped a lot like it does because it's volatile. They say, you see, look what happens, this risk, 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 that. What they failed to realize, what they failed to also say is if there was a Bitcoin denominated bond, right, backed by Bitcoin and the payments are denominated in Bitcoin and Bitcoin dropped 50% or 40%, let's say 50% more than it actually dropped. Yes, El Salvador would have taken a 50% capital loss on their Bitcoin, okay? Not necessarily realized, but we're taking a 50% loss. But what else would have El Salvador achieved? A 50% reduction in their debt service payments because the bond is the nominee of Bitcoin. So when the price of Bitcoin goes down, the price of their debt service goes down. When the price of Bitcoin goes up, the price of the debt service goes up. So they're not taking a loss. Okay. Now let's swap in the US dollar, and you can't say the same thing because El Salvador is able to control access to Bitcoin much easier than U.S. dollar swaps. And the U.S. dollar is actually very volatile. People don't seem to realize that. The concept of stable coins is a misnomer. Stable coins are not stable. They're stable relative to what they're denominated in. And some of them not even stable to that, actually. You still have a break. But let's assume they did what they had promised to do. Okay, Being stable to a U.S. dollar means you're still volatile to many currencies, to gold, Right. to oil, to almost anything. So these things are not difficult to understand. They're not big words, they're not a lot of syllables, and they're not difficult concepts. But people hear something, they tend to repeat it, and if it's repeated enough times, it's considered fact. It's not the way it works. Reggie, I'd like to stop you there. I'd like to just fork in the road, excuse the expression. Can you give me your thoughts on XRP? A lot of, I'd say, up-and-comers, and I think people that are pretty well-reasoned are on the XRP, and of course, they're in litigation at the present time, if, if you don't mind, can you share your thoughts on XRP? Uh, XRP is, I don't have a positive or negative thoughts on it. Um, its utility is derived solely from uh, Ripple using it. Uh, Ripple is in litigation. They're actually in litigation with the head prosecutor from the SEC, the same one that, you know, destroyed my business. I'm not going to mention his name, but same team, same guy. Um, I'd love to opine on the merits, but I don't think it would be a wise legal um, option or uh, decision, except for the fact that they're doing very well um, with their defense, better than any company I've ever seen that went up against the SEC. But as for XRP tokens themselves, you know, Ripple has a product called on demand liquidity, which basically um, allows entities to trade one currency into another currency without having reserves at each end. 
And it does that by using XRP as a bridge. So let's suppose you're in Britain and you have pounds. I'm in the US, I have US dollars. If we're banks, normally I'd have to have a bunch of pounds sitting around. You'd have to have a bunch of dollars to facilitate uh, this, these transactions. When you do that, that money is sitting there without earning any real compensation. Okay, just minimal interest, if anything. And um, it uh, has to be accounted for as capital, tier one capital. So there's a charge spent for money that is not earning money back. It's just sitting there waiting for a cross-currency transaction. So Ripple's business model says you can release these reserves. And then if I want to send you pounds, okay, I just send my U.S. dollars to Ripple. Ripple trades the U.S. dollars in the XRP and then trades the XRP in the pounds. And so we release our reserves and they go forward. But you don't really need XRP to do that. You know, there's this tall, handsome guy I heard of. <laughs> I run this joke all the time because it doesn't get old. I know everybody thinks it gets old, but I think it's funny. Right? It's this tall, handsome guy who came up with this idea in 2013 and patented it in 2014. And he did the same thing using Bitcoin, where you just take it, you trade U.S. dollar for Bitcoin, and then trade a Bitcoin for pounds. You could do it in one transaction and time it. Voila, no need for reserves. Okay. Um, now, that's not knocking XRP, but knowing that that's the sole um, utilitary use case for XRP that I can think of means that its value is not necessarily etched in stone. Now, if Ripple succeeds against the SEC, they have every incentive to use XRP and only XRP. So that's good for Ripple, and that's very good for XRP. If they don't succeed, cloudy and, and mucky. And then there's the potential, there's possible uh, um, patent infringement issues or you know IP issues that they may have going down the road with various patent holders, uh, more than one, I would think. Uh, but that's speculation on my part. Perhaps I can't speak. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an attorney, um, and I don't know every patent holder in the world. But um, I think that may or may not be the case going forward. Very insightful. I'm glad I asked the question. Well, I've got the, you know, this is a top-level view from my perspective. I mean, you've hit every question I want from a macro perspective. So I'm going to just hand it back over to you. Is there anything that you want our audience to know about, about, uh, you know, about cryptos, about Vertasium. Uh, can you comment on the ultra coin? I mean, can we still get involved with your project if we want to, or is it off limits? Can you just kind of round this out for us? It's an open floor and I want you to end with how to contact you. I don't know how much social media you do. I know you've certainly been on Max Kaiser RT and you've got your own YouTube channel, which I'm now a subscriber of, but that's a lot to put on your plate. Can you go ahead and sift through that for us? Well, um, I'm most active on Twitter. You can reach me at, at Reggie Middleton. Um, and at Reggie Middleton is my handle for most uh, social media or Veritasium Inc., but that's the company. Um, so, you know, contact me publicly on Twitter or DM me. Uh, and as for UltraCoin, UltraCoin is a marketing moniker for the software suite. Um, the SEC has pretty much destroyed that business completely. Um, the, the precious metals, they did not shut down, but they gutted it to the point where it's not practical. So we're just winding it down um, over time. The uh, patents, um, which you know were also involved, they were alleged to be fraudulent, not to be discussed, but as those started to uh, become granted, that assisted in fulfilling that portion of the business. Okay, and the patents are very interesting because uh, there's a decent amount of foresight that went in. Um, and I told you, not that I'm smarter than anybody else, I just came from a different background. So I was able to see what I normally do where other people didn't do that. So they didn't look at it from that perspective. And perhaps out of luck, perhaps out of skill, perhaps out of a combination of both, which is probably more reality, um, the industry is moving in the direction that the patent apps foresaw. Okay, and detailed in the claims and description, basically the Wall Streetification of the industry. But because it's being Wall Streetified, doesn't mean it has to be Wall Streetified by Wall Street. Right. Now, we have a better industry with more competition. Okay, but 
honestly, and that's what I want to see. That's the entire premise of my entire business is the democratization, democratization of access and peer-to-peer -peer capital markets, where capital markets are peer-to-peer -peer and not forced through gatekeepers. But that's not how I'm seeing it now because of the amount of power of the money set of banks, um, the extreme favoritism from regulators towards banks against relative to you know the entrepreneurial companies, and the fact that out of the entrepreneurial companies, we have big winners that don't seem to be uh, affected by regulators the same way the small guys are. Um, so we have essentially the beginning of many wealth money center banks within the industry as well. And they, I just don't see them having the headwinds. They have some headwinds, but they're not being put out of business. Um, both these little mini money center banks within the industry and the entrepreneurial upstarts and the very well-funded venture capital um, operations, which are the middle layer. They're all suffering from one thing, though, and that is a lack of proper due diligence, the type of due diligence that old school, you know, self-directed private equity style investors or hedge fund investors would do. Um, on the IP side, almost nobody does due diligence on intellectual property and patents. Um, a lot of the real estate that uh, the crypto industry is being built on, both on the public network side, like public Bitcoin, public Ethereum, and on the private side, the JP Morgans and uh, Goldman Sachs, um, they're building, they say $100 billion, trillion dollar industries on top of somebody else's land. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, this is not me talking my book. I am by far not the only one. Um, there's a, a couple of people I don't want to name them because they might not want to be named, but, you know, they're out in the public sphere. And they have some very interesting patents. Uh, the balance of those patents are owned by the usual suspects, Microsoft and IBM, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, et cetera. Um, luckily, there's still hope because the banking industry, the culture of the banking industry, doesn't allow for the type of creative um, extrapolations that were necessary to see into the future. What bank application or patent applications mostly do is find a way to create better banking products or bigger bonus pools. What we tried to do was we tried to obviate the needs for banks to begin with. Okay, so instead of creating a better horse and buggy, we're creating cars. Okay. Reggie, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is there any way that we, the people, can help with your vision at this point in time? Is there any anything we can do? I mean, can we buy... Vertasium and what, what would tell our my audience, our audience, what if there is a possibility to continue to help this along? Is there any way we can do that currently? Okay, well, I've disassociated myself. Well, I didn't. The government has disassociated me <laughs> with my tokens. Um, I don't own one that I can find or I know of. Um, I gave them all to the government or they took them, all the semantics. But there are about two million floating around. They're available, but they're rare, scarce, and thinly traded. And I am considering allowing those tokens to be a discount. It's serving for the original purpose, basically. You know, allow them to discount purchasing of patent licenses, custom consulting, etc. Um, if you go to this, um, if you go to the um, Veritasium official Telegram group, um, that's where the Veritasium community lives. Um, and if you download the Telegram app, Telegram app, the type in Veritasium official, there's roughly 4,000 members. Um, and you can ask them all the Veritasium, very token questions you want. You know, they're uh, there to help. There's also smaller subgroups. One of them is the VeriDAO, which is a DAO, a distributed autonomous organization right. um, that consists of professionals that have to be screened to get in. They screen for being a bad actor and for having certain talents. But if you are an engineer, developer, IP attorney, crypto attorney, et cetera, you can join the DAO and they help further the interests of Veritasium in general and the very community. Um, they've done things such as apply for no action letters to the SEC, of which they got no written response because they want clarity on the tokens and very useful, very professional, very um, business like things. Okay. There's but so much I want to discuss because I can't afford another round with the regulators. Right. 
you know, I didn't couldn't afford the first round, but I definitely can't afford the second round. Okay. So you're obviously a man of high integrity, and uh, I already made it clear that you know I'm on. Uh, I'm enamored with your philosophy, <clears throat> and it looks like there's not a whole lot we can do at this point. But I can just tell in your spirit, you're not giving up. So what do you see? as a possible good outcome going forward? Well, I am very bullish on the patents. Um, we were early with a strong concept. And in my opinion, the patents cover practically every major portion of the industry. Ethereum, the like network of Bitcoin, many of the proof of stake chains, many of the apps like the various swap apps, etc. cetera. Um, I am not, I, I study history. And one thing I do not like is litigation, number one. And I like uh, meritorious competition. So what I would like to do, if I'm correct, and again, I'm not an intellectual property attorney, and uh, I'm not a developer, I'm just a dad, but I think I'm good at being at at least, depending on how many of my kids you ask. Right? The um, I would like to see uh, cooperation with the entities in the space. Um, so the goal is to take the IP and to use it to further the space. Um, think of Qualcomm. Um, we have a lot of people in the open source space who are anti-patent and the Wall Street Bank's about to teach the folly of that right now. But before the Wall Street Bank's get fully in there, a lot of the more successful projects have already learned the folly of it. If you take a look at uh, Uniswap and Ave and Compound, They've all put gates around an intellectual property, okay? Because it's very difficult to sell something that somebody else is giving away for free. But see, this was known beforehand. It's just that the culture wasn't that of a business um, executive. It was more of that of an open source developer. Not knocking that because I doubt if most business executives make very good open source developers. But there's a lot of diversity and expertise needed to succeed here. And if you try to do it all on your own, it, you know, it doesn't look good. So um if you look at the cell phone industry and the chip industry there was a lot of contention there's a lot of fighting made a lot of lawyers rich but the fastest growing industry in the history of this country was probably mobile phones before then it would have been the internet so you can't say that the ability to patent this and this ip was bad for the cell phone industry when it leapfrogged everything else in the world and if you think of qualcomm we are qualcomm um, licensed its IP out as a business model. Very efficient, it worked, and it created a level playing field or a more level playing field for almost everybody else. So it still takes a large amount of capital to jump into that space, okay? But much less when everybody has access to licensed Qualcomm's technology for their Qualcomm chips. Very good. So that's what I would like to see for this industry as well. Now, what I like and what I get <laughs> not necessary corollary, but you asked and I told you. Well, I wanted to hear it. So I think we'll go ahead and close out there. Reggie, I want to thank you for your time and uh, your visionary stance on a lot of things financial. I'm sure we'll be visiting in the future. And I'll just hand it back to you if there's anything else you'd like to close out with. Um, that was it. There was something that I wanted to correct, but uh, I can't remember because, you know, age is getting the best of me. Okay. But um, thank you, and you're quite a gentleman, so I, I appreciate that. Okay, and look to do uh, you know collaborations in the future. Very good, thank you.